Mm. I'm so honored to introduce the extraordinary uh, group of feminists, um, thinkers, and activists who um, will speak to us today for our keynote. I'm Sarah Haley. I'm here in the Department of Gender Studies and African American Studies. Um, and I just want to say that um, the speakers tonight in our keynote are uh, courageous world makers. They are intrepid intellectuals and they are generous comrades and I'm delighted to be here with them. Mariam Kaba is an organizer, educator and curator who is active in movements for racial, gender and transformative justice. She is the founder and director of Project Mia, a grassroots organization with a vision to end youth incarceration. She has co-founded multiple organizations and projects over the years, including We Charge Genocide, the Chicago Freedom School, the Chicago Task Force on Violence um, Against Girls and Young Women, Love and Protect, and most recently, Survive and Punish. As a researcher in residence at the Barnard Center for Research on Women, Mariam Cabo works with Andrea Ritchie, um, a fellow researcher in residence on a new social justice initiative, Interrupting Criminalization, Research in Action. She is on numerous advisory boards. She has um, a slew of publication, voluminous publication record, um, including publications in The Nation, Magazine, The Guardian, The Washington Post, in these times, Teen Vogue, New Inquiry, and more. She runs Prison Culture Blog, and she has Prison Culture on Twitter. Um, famously. Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> Mariam's work has been recognized with several honors and awards, and CSW was proud to honor her vision and inspire continued work in her tradition by establishing the Mariam Kaba uh, Graduate Fellowship in Black Feminist Research this year. Mimi Kim is a longtime advocate and activist working on issues of gender-based based violence in communities of color. She is a co-founder of Insight, Women, Transgender, and Gender Non-Conforming People of Color Against Violence. Can give Insight round of applause, please. Um, in 2004, she established creative interventions which helped to develop collective, liberatory, and non-criminalizing approaches to address and end domestic and sexual violence. And she has worked actively to develop feminist community accountability and transformative uh, justice political frameworks and practices. Mimi is the author of a number of highly influential publications, ground clearing, um, uh, really influential publications on the historical development of carceral feminism and contemporary transformation, transformative justice movements, including uh, her work, The Carceral Creep, Gender-Based Violence, Race, and the Expansion of the Punitive State, 1973 to 1983. She is an assistant professor of social work at California State University, Long Beach. Emily Thuma is an assistant professor of US politics and law at the University of Washington, Tacoma, and formerly an assistant professor of gender uh, and sexuality studies at UC Irvine. She researches and teaches at the intersection of 20th century US history and politics, feminist and queer studies, critical race and ethnic studies, legal studies, and carceral studies. Her transformational book, All Our Trials, Prisons, Policing, and the Feminist Fight to End Violence, was published by the University of Illinois Press in 2019. All Our Trials was recently named a finalist for one of the most prestigious awards in the field of gender history, the Organization of American Historians, Mary Nicholas Prize. A longtime participant in movements for racial and gender justice, Thuma is a member of the California Coalition for Women Prisoners. Okay, we have to give CCWP a round of applause. Um, along with one of last year's thinking uh, gender keynote speakers, Elisa Bieria, uh, <laughs> Emily uh, coordinates the Feminist Decarceral Research Initiative. Okay, uh, I'll get to it because you don't have much time. Uh, so 
each of you have done such incredible work um, helping us understand the collusion between you know, the battered women's movement and the carceral state, helping us um, uh, reimagine what we mean by abolition, um, reorient the problems around policing, helping us think about, um, really elucidate um, the most vibrant and incredible anti-carceral feminist historical movements, right? Um, but your work has emerged in conversation, um, in collaboration. You all know each other, have worked together, have encountered each other in organizing movements as well as in movements around, uh, in, in conversation about your writing. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how your ideas and your organizing work has evolved in, in conversation and what those collaborations have been like. Okay, um, hello everybody. Um, I'll start, well the Supremes began. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was thinking about this um, as I was preparing to come here. Like, when did I first meet Maryam? And when did I first meet M? And all the many, many conversations that we've had. I'm not exactly the sure, sure of the year, but Maryam Kava has been, you know, in Chicago. Chicago people do this work hard. They've been doing it forever. And I know that when I started more explicitly doing this work, that folks in Chicago had a gathering, 2007, I think, um, where they were talking about, I don't know, if we, we weren't all using the language of transformative justice at the time, but I think you know the language is emerging, the frameworks were emerging, the politics were emerging. Um, of course, they've always been there. But in terms of a moment where people were really trying to coalesce, um, that was a time when I remember um, going out there and being in a room with 75 people that gathered to, to talk about what are we gonna do um, around police violence and gender-based violence that doesn't involve the police. So that was one of the first moments, if not the first moment that I met, not only Miriam, but a whole bunch of folks in Chicago that continue to do this work, that had been doing this work, that really inspired me. And it also made me think that I was in Chicago in an earlier time, the late 1980s, around the time when you were coming to the movement, the time that I was coming into the movement, at a time when we were really organizing as women of color that were in the funded movement and just were entering. and had to really fight our ways in there because it was almost completely run by white women, and that it was the black woman that I worked in solidarity with in Chicago in the late 1980s that shed blood, sweat, and tears to really say, we need to be running these institutions, and you have got to move out of the way. And Beth Ritchie came and really gave, offered us a lot of support. So some of these, these conversations have been going on. Not They're not just conversations. They are actual action. They are actual responses on a daily basis to the oppression that we've had in our communities, experience in the communities, but also how we look towards the institute, anti-violence institutions to be somewhere where they were going to respond and they weren't at all. This has been going on obviously a long, long time, but that's a point of entry. Um, M had been doing that work and M and I met a little bit later. Some of it was struggling around um, some of our intellectual labor too, as well as like, what are we writing? What's the, what, what is that we're also trying to produce intellectually? How is it that we're trying to make sense of the history of movement and movements that we care a lot about? Um, thank you so much for having me. I'm really honored to be here and to be sharing a panel with each of you who I admire so much. And I love this question um, because it lets me speak to that. And um, Sarah, when you introduced Mimi, you mentioned that she was a co-founder of Insight. And so I think one of the ways that Miriam and Mimi's work has really influenced me is through the work that you both have done to build Insight over many years. Um, and I just think about Insight as such a like condition of possibility for the ways that I think and move in the world, how I organize, um, who I organize with, 
um, how I write, who I write for. Um, and I actually think we met for the first time in 2002, so even earlier. I was thinking about it too, getting ready to come. And um, in late 1999, I got organized into a black feminist-led radical anti-rape organization in Seattle by Elisa B. Area. <laughs> Um, thank you forever for that. Um, in Seattle, Washington, called CARA, Communities Against Rape and Abuse. And um, in 2002, Elisa and I traveled to Baltimore. Speaking of funders, because funders had organized us <laughs> to come together um, to share strategies with folks from Asian Women's Shelter, where you were working at the time. And so, you know, I, and then we kind of didn't see each other for a number of years, but um, but I think in this, and then I didn't meet Miriam for the first time in person until 2014. Um, and Miriam, maybe I'll let you tell the story of how we came to meet. But but I, what I want to say is that long before I had met you, and um, and even in those years when we weren't in close touch, Mimi, I I feel like you were both such indirect teachers of mine, and and that the spaces you're both like tool makers and space makers and and people here who know these two know this, like you all are always incubating, um, you know, projects and collectivities that then the rest of us get to learn from and engage with. And, and so I just am again, really grateful to, to be here in this moment. And then I think the other thing that connects all of us is our interest in, in this, um, how we tell these movement histories. And I keep threatening Miriam that one of these days I'm going to do research in her storage space because she kind of basically has her own archive going. I have several storage spaces. <laughs> I just don't have one. Um, <laughs> several. But, um, but I think that that's the other thing that maybe connects us is, is that we're trying to understand um, how to really see um, these radical pasts as, you know, usable in the present and, and how, um, and how, these, the ways in which we remember and forget um, earlier organizing as Miriam's talk so beautifully showed us, um, I think also really is like the stakes of that are stakes that I think we're all invested in. Um, yeah, short answer for me was that I actually met Mimi, we met at um, Color of Violence 2. Did you come to that in Chicago? <laughs> I, I'm, I don't, like, this is really a problem, honestly, of age, is that my memory is terrible. And I'm, I'm seriously, I do not understand when it happened because it, like, hit me, you know? It had to be a process. Anyway, so, but I remember that we met uh, in two, 2002 in Chicago because I was on the planning team of that conference for Insight. But one of the things, but we, but we did not connect around this specific work we were doing around community accountability until you came to the gathering we did in 07 um, in Chicago. But um, I feel very much like uh, Mimi's work has been such a grounding thing for me. Um, it helped me find a political home when I did not feel like I had one at that particular moment in time. Um, I, when CR, Critical Resistance, started, I was really excited and activated by that but I felt kind of outside of it um, because the work was focused so much on the prison and incarcerated people in the pr you know, and I was very keen on that, but I also recognized the issue of gender-based violence as not being central. So when Insight came together and then brought the statement together, it was an articulation of so much of what I believe that I felt very much tied to that. So it's been, uh, you know, all, the, all those years, this is the 20th year of the first Insight Conference this year. Um, and uh, we're celebrating that 20th anniversary of Insight in New York um, at Barnard at the end of um, April, April 30th. And it'll be a panel and Mimi will be on it and other people will be on it so we get to reflect on all that work. Um, Emily, I met because, <laughs> so randomly stupid, but it shows my nerdness. Um, I actually read people's dissertations, by the way. <laughs> You will be happy to know those of you who are writing dissertations that have any, you know, that they, you're only your committee and maybe your mother if you force her reads. Mm -hmm. I actually read people's dissertations. And what happened was I saw that this person had written this dissertation about anti prison organizing in the 1970s by feminists. And I was like, who the hell is this? I must read this dissertation. And I'm not paying any fucking money to any university. 
a hundred and whatever dollars to read it. So I just found Emily's um, email address and I emailed her and I said, hi, my name's Miriam. I really want to read your dissertation. Will you send it to me? And I think you must have just fallen off your chair in shock. Not because it was me emailing, because who knows, right? But it was like, somebody wants to read this? Yes! <laughs> so I don't know. It didn't take long for Emily to send me that information. I was expecting. It was like, a, it was like the next day it came. I was like, yes! Anyway, I read it, and then I was like, okay, now I read this, and I don't know you, but I want to I wanna get to know you more, because... You know, I really was impressed by the dissertation. Again, something that not many people will say, because usually it's, they're terribly written and they are dumb. But one of the things that happened... No, 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 sorry, no I don't mean I that at all. That I, is not I don't true. mean your dissertation. That is not I mean your friends. True. I don't mean yours. But, I, you know, because they make you talk to the literature. It's like, the what? Oh my I don't want to talk to this friggin' Boudoir. I don't care about him, Boudoir. I'm not interested. You know, whatever. So you've got all this stuff going on. But I read it and I was like, this is well written and I really am learning some shit from this and I would love to have Emily come to Chicago and talk about her work. So that's how we met, is that I asked her to come. We ho hosted an event at DePaul to talk about criminalized survival in 2014. So that's how we came together in that way. But um, yeah, but I feel very much like, again, yes, read people's dissertations. At least let them feel like somebody's reading that shit before the 10 years that it's gonna take for them to write the book, you know? Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> write good dissertations too. So when Mariam reads I mean, them, she, which she will, it won't be a bad situation exactly. for you. Okay. Um, <laughs> so Mariam uh, gave us a, a historical moment already, you know, 1977. Um, the Santa Cruz letter, the Santa Cruz organization to think about, you know, what are the sort of critical figures or moments in history that we don't, we just can't forget, right? Like in thinking about our intellectual and activist work, like you all have written about, I was just reading, you know, again, rereading your work actually, and you've, you've written about people, including Ida B. Wells, Juanita Thomas, the Through the Looking Glass Collective, Mari Matsuda, Desi Woods, these are just like a handful of people that we, you know, know about or don't know about, right? Some of them are famous, some anonymous, but I'm wondering if each of you could like think, uh, tell us a little bit about a kind of pivotal figure or moment um, that helps us think about today. Oh, okay. Well, you know, I'm gonna actually really build on what Mariam was saying is that some of the pivotal people are people you have never heard of, mm -hmm. you will never hear of, who probably don't even remember they did something pivotal because they do pivotal things all the fucking time. So I, when I was really, you know, we did, you know, we thought a little bit about what we might talk about today. So I was really thinking, who are the pivotal people? Um, the historical um, work I did, you know, tend to look at some pivotal people that I thought I disagreed with the pivots they made. But when I really, I was just recalling the story that a friend of mine told me about, and this is her, she's Indonesian, and her, I'm just going to give you an example, her mom, her sister had been in a terribly abusive relationship. Um, her mother got completely sick of it, and she took her sewing shears and put it to her sister's husband and said, if you do not leave this house right now, I will kill you. Now that's not a very transformative justice moment, but it is a community response to violence. And I was, I knew she came from a place where, you know, people said, oh, it's so patriarchal. Her mother stood up and did, took action to actually protect her daughter from continued abuse from this man. It was something that wasn't usually done, but it was something she knew she could do. She did do, and that was completely effective in driving this man away. So I remember hearing that, that was quite a few years ago. That was before I was doing that work, this work. But that is the story that came up. And that is the story, and those types of stories that I continue to hear, that was, 
probably before we were really imagining that we were doing this work, but I would think I was, in fact, it was, I think it was before I was doing Antaran's work specifically. Um, but it stayed with me. And as we were talking about some of these transformations we were trying to make, you know, post insight and really thinking about um, what transformative justice would look like, we got more stories like that. And people were like, oh, transformative justice or a community accountability it must be such a big, what is it? Oh my God. And if you just sat there for a while, how many of them had their own stories? You mean it's like mm -hmm. what I did with my friends when I was in high school? Oh, you mean it's like what my aunt just did? Oh, it's, you mean it's like what my mom told me happened back a few years? I, these are the stories that it took, that, that nobody took as an intervention of violence, nobody paid attention to. And these, these are the very things that people have been doing for generations and generations and generations that I really want to uplift. And um, that, that story is the one that came to mind to share with you tonight. Um, I guess I'm thinking about, well, so I got the beautiful postcard. The swag for this conference is really visionary yeah. swag. Um, and Ariel? there's the postcard that you all put together. Um, and you have the, uh, let's see, I wrote it down, Inez and Joanne and Desi and Yvonne and Marissa. Um, and so I'm really grateful on the last panel which that I saw, which was phenomenal, so phenomenal, the panel on carcerality and abolition. Mm -hmm. um, Ayana Devante Spencer um, was already invoking the name of Joanne Little and, and talking a little bit about her case. Um, I think that, I guess I wanna lift up the campaigners specifically, uh, uh, in mm. addition to yeah. um, Inez Garcia, Joanne Little, Desi Woods, and Yvonne Wanro, now Swan. Um, I think that, you know, the labor and the work that scores and scores of everyday ordinary people did to um, not only free those individual people um, to um, save their lives um, literally from either death by incarceration or, or death by the death penalty, um, but to also, um, you know, rally around these particular individuals and as Mariam and Elisa and others here have, have written about as well, kind of thinking about the work that participatory defense can do um, to build our um, political educations, to um, actually uh, build collectivities of people that can then um, move around other kinds of organizing targets, um, to create um, collectivities of people who can care for one another and support each other's survival. Um, this shift from rallying around an individual person, and we're all up here thanks to Sarah Haley wearing free Joanne Little buttons from 1975 that she brought us today. Um, so I feel like we would be remiss to not speak of her um, in this moment. So I, I wanted to do that. Um, but I think that those cases and the ways in which they were so different from one another, but that labor, that intellectual labor of grassroots organizers and activists and the loved ones of um, of those four women um, and those four women themselves who became politicized in new ways through, um, you know, through their ordeals and, and came to rally and express solidarity with one another. Um, just all of that tremendous labor that taught us so many lessons about the dangerous intersection between um, racial criminalization and gender-based violence. Um, and then Marissa Alexander's name, you know, um, being included in that list and thinking about, um, you know, this kind of routes us back to the first question, actually, because, you know, I think uh, when I came out to Chicago, um, that was still a moment when, you know, the protracted struggle to entirely free Marissa Alexander, not just, you know, out of prison, but off of house arrest. Um, maybe we can talk later about incarceration and domestic violence super important thing to be thinking about right now. Um, but I think that that campaign and the work that you did, Miriam, to um, put together the No Cells to Defend project, which was an art exhibit and also a booklet. And that was probably the first time we really collaborated on something. Um, and, and so situating Marissa Alexander's case in this long genealogy, beginning with, to name um, another person who Ayana lifted up today, um, Celia, um, an enslaved woman who, you know, fought back in 1850 
um, and killed her um, abuser. So thinking about this long genealogy of um, the criminalization um, of especially black women, um, as well as indigenous women um, and Latina self-defense against um, uh, sexual and domestic violence. Um, so that's coming to mind as something I think really um, just bursts into the present and continues to be a strategy that can um, accomplish so much more than freeing individual people as important fundamentally as you know individual people's freedom um, is. And I think I'll pick up on that. How many people have heard the name uh, Queen Mother Audley Moore? Put your hand up. Like a couple, yeah. It's not surprising um, for many reasons, but you know, I came up, I got politicized through black nationalism, um, through the nation and through kind of like, those are the folks who raised me into becoming somebody who uh, would have a political mindset. It was a very, wow. It was a very uh, masculinist space and movement. I saw myself fundamentally as a black person, not as a black woman. Um, in my kind of growing up and over in my teen years, it wasn't until I went to college that it occurred to me that uh, I embodied, uh, you know, I had a gender, you know, like it, 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 like I had to come to consciousness around that in a very specific way. But somebody who was a really big influence in my uh, politicization and understanding of that is a woman named Audley Moore, who uh, was is is an organizer of long standing. Uh, you know, lived until she was in her 90s, uh, lived in Harlem, um, but had come from Delta, Louisiana. Uh, and, uh, and what you now hear everybody talking about, which is reparations, oddly more, is the modern mother of the reparations movement in the United States. She is the person who started, whose uh, work funded something called NCOBRA, which people may know about as the reparations space. But Audley Moore's work, interestingly enough, also had sexual violence as its center. She had been a domestic in the South. She had had daily sexualized assaults against her. She never spoke, right, in the culture of dissemblance, you know, Darlene Clark Hines kind of conception of that. Audley Moore never spoke of her own assaults that she faced but she did face them. She understood the vulnerability of black women and girls. She believed in the importance of having black men be kind of strong patriarchal leaders to protect black women, right? But it was that kind of notion, but she herself eschewed all the kind of traditional gender roles that black women she was advocating a step into, really weird and contradictory, uh, but she's terrific. But here's why I wanted to bring her up, which is that uh, she, in in 1958, as uh, with part of a group that she had funded called the Universal Association of Ethiopian Women, they were talking about sexual violence against black women, a man who was on death row, who had been on death row because he supposedly raped a white woman. Their case at the time in 58 was no white man who's raped a black woman has ever had death row, has never been prosecuted. And so black women have no equal protection under the law and therefore we're outside the polity of the United States. We ought to form our own nation, right? So this is her kind of way. But then she says, but the US owes black people and particularly black women for all of the years of enslavement and the sexual violence and reproductive violence against black women. So when she made her platform, she wrote a book, a little pamphlet called Why Reparations, which is the founding of the kind of COBRA movement. And in that, one of the demands is that the U.S. owes black people because of the rapes of black women. So that's put in there in a very explicit way from a woman you would never consider to be feminist. She would reject that label for herself. And yet, and yet, in her own life, profoundly feminist, in the demands she was making, profoundly feminist, yeah, while also still having kind of espousing a traditional black woman gender role, you know, masculinism to protect. So I would just uplift oddly more as someone you should know. And if you're interested, uh, 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 Ashley Farmer, who's at Texas, is writing a book and biography about uh, Queen Mother Moore. So that should come out in the next few years and be worth people looking into. Okay, we're really virtually out of time, but I do want to ask one more question, <laughs> um, which, um, is, you know, if we could leave us with 
um, your sense of either the most dangerous sort of discourse, political maneuvers, and you mentioned um, incarceration, right? Like policy initiatives or the most exciting um, for us to think about, you know, what should we sort of be turning our attention to um, as we're thinking about um, this question? Do I have to start again? Well, we do have, we're going to have Q&A, so you can say whatever you want during okay. that. You don't even have to listen to the questions. You can just make your own statements. <laughs> Thank you. I kid, because I love um, it. Well, OK, I don't, I'm not sure if this is the most dangerous, but it is a dangerous one. And in part due to the success of the, of the abolitionist movement, um, you know, we, we have calls for restorative justice right now, right? Um, many, many calls for restorative justice. And um, just briefly, I think one of the dangers that I see is the ways in which transformative justice is either misused because people love transformative and like, I'm gonna do transformative justice with the cops. Oh, let's put the transform, you know, I like that word transformative. I'm not, you know, I I'm not gonna say criminal justice. I'm like, no, you can't just use that word. That is not, so that, that is part of this. I think the other part of it is that I think we're, we're st starting to see funding for restorative justice, and I don't want to make a blanket statement that restorative justice is bad. It is not. In fact, a lot of us blend transformative justice, restorative justice. We learn from each other. Um, but there's also a way in which restorative justice has been used as part of the carceral system has been used as diversion. It's like, well, at least it's better than locking somebody up, that we're gonna have restorative justice. And that I, you know, we, some of us saw the tsunami coming and now it's here, there's like a re restorative justice center that's being funded by the Department of Justice, for, ex for example, that is very much gonna set models that believe me are gonna be based upon their relationship with the criminal justice system. And they're talking about evidence-based and they're talking about oh, we really love it if you're going to do a randomized controlled trial, that's even better. And that some people that, have, that are like, wow, this is a moment where we've been waiting for. Look at the Department of Justice is going to fund something like this. Danger. That is dangerous. I, we have to be very, very, very aware of the ways in which things are going to be brought back to us and presented as what we asked for. It is not. And so I, I, I really, really ask us to be extremely careful about the popularity of even transforming justice and the way it's going to be misused and has been. And also, what does restorative justice really, really mean? I'm just thinking about everything you were just saying. OK, um, well, I think one thing just to, in terms of a danger that Miriam raised earlier that I really appreciated and it resonated with me was um, when Miriam was kind of drawing the line in the sand about abolition and <laughs> non-abolition. Um, I think something that I've, I have noticed in the last couple of years is as, as more and more people are taking up the mantle of abolition, um, there's this kind of move to make it more of a liberal project and to kind of like make it as palatable and sellable, you know, as possible. And what comes with that is a splitting of prison abolition from policing abolition, from um, an anti-capitalist analysis, from um, uh, you know, an analysis of structural racism. Um, so, so that's one thing that's coming to mind um, as a danger. In terms of something exciting, specifically around organizing around sexual violence right now, I just want to lift up um, the California Coalition for Women Prisoners has been um, uh, organizing a campaign called Me Too Behind Bars over the last several years. Um, and it grew out of a, a lawsuit brought by several 
um, people incarcerated in women's prisons in California, specifically in CCWF, the women's prison up north. Um, and the, all of the plaintiffs in the lawsuit identify as trans or gender nonconforming or queer. Um, and the lawsuit was um, uh, you know, a grievance against um, sexual violence, sexual harassment, homophobic and transphobic harassment. Um, and I just am really, I'm, I haven't been directly a participant in that particular aspect of CCWP's work, but I'm really moved by and excited and hopeful about the ways that um, that campaign is sort of speaking to this Me Too moment and trying to transform and open up the conversation and really shift the narrative to make sure that we are thinking about um, how se sexual violence is, as Miriam said earlier, um, fundamental to um, the kind of everyday workings of prison regimes, right? Like that it's, this, it's not this kind of bad apple scenario. It's not this exceptional scenario that it is, you know, a fundamental tool of discipline and social control. Um, and so I think that, that, you know, I'm optimistic, I guess, that, that that campaign has been able to gain traction over the last several years, that um, it has, you know, grown from being focused on the lawsuit to, to, you know, sort of identifying larger targets. And I would encourage anybody to learn more about it by visiting the California Coalition for Women Prisoners website. Um, I think, I'm, you know, I, I'm wor I worry about everything, so I'm not going to go down that list. I, I, I just, I don't, I think people don't read. I don't, I don't think people want to study anything. I think, you know what I mean? And I, and I think that's a problem for movement work and movement building. So I, I, I would just worry about all of it. Um, so I'm, I'm just gonna let, leave that there and, and say that I'm encouraged, however, by a couple of things that I'm seeing. One is that, you know, I was approached by the National Coalition Against Sexual Violence or Sexual Assault in my state in New York uh, to help them coordinate a conference that's happening in June in New York State called Ending Violence Without Violence. Uh, which takes into account a lot of the things we're talking about today and also, uh, you know, is trying to also do something that I find very encouraging, which is to not say that the center of this work ought to be in these current nonprofit rape crisis centers, but that the workers in those centers and spaces are also community members and that they can take their expertise and use it within their community. So Ms. Casa is not gonna not saying we should now do transformative justice at our center. That's not the goal. And I was very encouraged in how they shaped that and thought about that. But they were like, how can we use the resources of the spaces we know to help disseminate more knowledge and information so people know about these approaches and opportunities and then that they could use it as advocates in their own lives and that they can take what they already know about sexual violence and kind of see the community as broader than the, their little space or broader than their just neighborhood and just start to kind of infuse the knowledge further in different places, which is what got me excited to actually participate in working and building this. I think it's the right way to think about this. I don't want centers for rape crisis to become transformative justice centers. I don't think they can do that work not with their very close alignment with the state and the funding sources and the fact that most of them are their main funder is the attorney general's office or you know the da <laughs> you know the state's attorney like they, it's just not going to work out in the way that we would imagine so i'm very encouraged by things like that and opportunities like that that i see happening around the country oh i forgot there was a, the positive tip to this so i just want to Oh, you said or? Okay. Oh. oh, everybody else cheated, so I'm going to too. But uh, what I want to do is, you know, what I do want to give a shout out. I mean, we are in LA. It's not just a horrible place, as Miriam said. It's <laughs> lovely as well. And I know, I mean, how many people here are doing transformative justice work? Raise your hand. There's, there's some of you. And I want to give a shout out to Youth Justice Coalition. Um, here in LA, that's been really, really holding it down for many years in terms of really trying to figure out what it is, what is it to bring community together, and um, and form a community that's rooted not just in being able to do a process, but really rooted in the principles of transformative justice. So I, I know there's others in the room, but um, I felt like I couldn't 
leave this room without saying something about Youth Justice Coalition. I really am proud of you all and honored to be a part of that community.